record button. Thank you everybody so much for coming today. This is our last class. My name is Sumamudan. I have been a master gardener since 2014. And uh, we have been running this series, uh, Landscape Success for the benefit of community. Uh, these are the virtual series. We also have uh, one in in-person that we do at our um, uh, master gardeners in Rosenberg. So we have, so we had uh, several classes starting in February, and this is the last class for the season. And probably this is one of the most important uh, based on all the winters we have been going through recently. Uh, unpredictable winters, unpredictable weather patterns, and we all need to now change the way we are thinking and Deborah is going to help us with that uh, not so appealing prospect. So let me introduce Deborah to you. Uh, Deborah Birch has earned her certification as a Fort Bend Master, a County Master Gardener in 2002. Uh, she has since earned advanced training certifications in citrus, home fruit, fuzz detector, and plant disease. Uh, so these are all in addition to everything uh, we do as master gardeners. We specialize in a few things and Deborah has specialized in a lot of things and more than her formal training, she has uh, she she is an expert in citrus and um, so many various uh, areas that she has been um, like handling our hot hotline for many years. It's not an easy job to do that because we'll be fielded with questions, so many different questions, and we should be able to answer them. And Deborah has been doing that for many, many years. And for all of us, she is the go-to person whenever we are stuck. Uh, Deborah also maintains a home orchard of over, uh, over 60 trees and vines, both in ground and in containers. In her spare time, she wrangles a herd of Texas longhorns, chickens, guinea fowl, and dogs. So master, as master gardeners, we are one of our primary responsibilities or uh, the thing that gives us a lot of tremendous joy is to help the community with the any every aspect of gardening. So we are on the speakers bureau uh, of several garden clubs and we do this uh, free classes for community. So check it out, become a master gardener. It's not only, you'll not only learn how to grow plants, but you'll also grow friendships. So without much ado, I'll turn the mic to Deborah. But before that, I just want to uh, go over a couple of uh, housekeeping. Please uh, uh, mute yourself. And if we haven't done so already, like uh, please uh, disable your video so that our recording will be of higher quality. And also, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat room. And as Deborah is speaking, and if it is related to what she's speaking, I will run the question by her. If one of us knows the answers, we will put it in the chat room. And any links that Deborah mentions, we will try to put it in the chat room. So feel free to take a picture of those links. And you will also get a recording of this. Uh, and one of the best things you can do starting December and January and February, when there's nothing else to do in the garden, is to watch, re-watch all these videos. So you will get access to all the videos and you can watch them at your leisure. And thank you. And here is the mic for you, Deborah. Thank you, Suma. That was a very nice um, commercial for becoming a master gardener. As master gardeners, we receive a uh, training from Texas A&M professors and extension specialists. And then we volunteer our time to go out into the community and to assist homeowners in uh, creating a successful home landscape. So one of the concepts that we are taught by uh, the people at A&M is the disease triangle. And we're gonna go over just a few basics to start with, and then we'll talk about winter because this all plays in together. So one of the ways to have a really healthy uh, garden is to have a garden that has the least amount of pressure from pathogens such as fungi, bacteria, that type of thing. 
So you think of the triangle kind of like a three-legged stool. If one leg is removed, that stool will fall down. So the three legs are the host, which is that plant that you value very much. Another leg is the pathogen, uh, bacteria, virus, insects that would like to attack that plant. But the cohesive element, the thing that brings it all together is the favorable environment. And so that would be air temperature. Uh, an example would be uh, spider mites love to breathe. Their favorite environment is very hot and humid weather. And that is why at the end of summer, you're going to see a lot of spider mite damage and something you want to look for. So if we could take away one of these legs uh, each time we feel that our, our garden is threatened, we can, um, we can stop that, um, that cycle of disease. So it could be as simple as you have a plant, you have a, a group of, of uh, plantings of pansies, let's say, and one of them is looking um, tired and wilted, take it out. There's no reason to keep trying to get that one plant to grow when it definitely is unhealthy and unhealthy plants bring disease into your garden. So disease triangle, really important, remove one element and you no longer have disease. That's the takeaway. So there are several ways to try to uh, improve the environmental control of your landscape. One is cultural, one is mechanical, biological, and chemical. Cultural is the least invasive. It's the method that has the least amount of unintended consequences. Whereas chemical, you have more of an opportunity to impact your environment and have unintended uh, consequences. Cultural control is really as simple as just buying a variety that has resistance to certain viruses or a resistance to certain uh, insects. It's uh, using good cultural uh, sanitation, like raking up all disease leaves, removing weeds, that type of thing. Mechanical is just making a barrier between um, your insect or pathogen pressure and your plant. You can do that with um, tanglefoot. Tanglefoot is a sticky substance. You put it on the bark of, your, well, actually you put it on a piece of linen and then tie that around the bark of your tree. And as insects try to climb up your trunk, they get caught in it and they can't get to your leaves or to your fruit. Also organza bags around fruit weeding because most insects, a number of viruses and some bacteria will harbor and grow in weed patches and then will infect your, um, your garden. Using traps, and just simply using a, a very hard spray of water to wash insects off of your plant works well. Biological control is simply encouraging um, your beneficial insects by planting food for them to eat over the winter or planting a habitat that encourages them. It's using um, nature-based uh, products like diametaceous earth or using oils. Chemical control, there are many different chemicals. There are insect uh, inhibitors like uh, this regulator. <clears throat> there's pheromone like sticky steaks. Um, there's a scent on the steaks that will draw the insect to it and it sticks and dies. This is, um, even though it says safe ruin, it is really not that safe because it's a indiscriminate. It doesn't matter if it's a beneficial insect or a uh, predator insect, 
once it's on the tape, it's stuck. You can also use biological like BT or chemical, which is uh, a, a soap. So pesticides are formulated to kill, harm, repel, or mitigate one or more species of insects. They work in different ways. They can disrupt the nervous system, damage the ectoskeleton, simply repel them, or control their ability to grow or reproduce. But remember, there are different levels of risk to non-target insects, people, pets, and the environment. So disease spreads in many, many ways. Some of them you have absolutely no control over because they're blown in by the wind. Fire blight, uh, canker, all of these are, are spores that are blown in by the wind. Uh, they come in on the rain. Um, brown rot, all of those are, are difficult uh, to control until they're on your plant. However, other disease-causing pathogens uh, are mechanically spread, so pruning. Uh, you can mitigate that by simply cleaning your pruning shears between each tree. Irrigating, cultivating, even mowing can uh, spread many pathogens. Injury to roots and limbs of trees are caused by weed eaters and, or weed whackers and lawnmowers and they can uh, bring disease into your tree. Fungus and bacteria do overwinter in leaf litter, mulch, and in soil. So if you have it, if you witness uh, the signs of this in the fall, it will come back in the spring and will reinfect your plants. Many people think that fungicides are the answer to whatever is going on with their plant. But research has shown that the overuse of fungicides has resulted in resistance in insects and in the target fungus. Also, we need to remember that there are beneficial fungi in the soil. It has a symbiotic relationship with our plants and it helps feed the plants water and nutrients it also will help produce growth hormones and it helps the plant uh, with protection from disease and pest. Fungicides will disrupt and kill this community of fungi in the soil. So overuse is very detrimental to your plants. But hey, weren't we talking about winter? So we will move on. The first thing you wanna do when you're thinking of preparing for your winter season is to take a critical look at your lawn and your garden. Mowing. If your yard is still growing, you will want to mow until it goes dormant. Bermuda grass and St. Augustine grass normally go dormant in the winter because they are warm season grasses. However, many people in our area will overseed their lawn with ryegrass, and if you do that, it means you will have to continue mowing throughout the winter. Fertilizing. It's past time to fertilize your lawn, and it really should not be done unless you have overseeded. If you do overseed your lawn, you want to fertilize in December, again in February. You want to use a half pound of nitrogen for 1,000 square feet and use only a nitrogen fertilizer such as a 2100. Watering. Turn off your irrigation during the winter months. Your lawn is not growing and it does not need it. The only thing you're watering now are weed and weed seeds. However, if you've overseeded, you will have to continue your irrigation. This is also the time to put down pre and post emergent herbicides as needed for controlling winter annual broadleaf weeds. As far as disease is concerned, look for gray spot. It's the most common disease here in uh, the fall 
and it's uh, really a result of overwatering. Garden beds. You want to remove any spent annuals or any annuals that look like they're tired and worn out. You want to weed and clean because again, insects are looking for a place to hide for the winter. You want to divide your perennials and transplant your cool season plants. You want to inspect your plants for disease and insect pressure. Use healthy leaves as mulch or compost. And in general, you want to plant trees and shrubs. Prune dead limbs and twigs from trees. Plant grass seeds if you desire, but remember you'll have to fertilize, mow, and continue watering. And insulate your pipes. If you wait until the report comes that we've got a big event coming, you know the pipe insulation is gonna be sold out. So buy it now and start wrapping one pipe a week and then you're done before the cold weather gets here. Gather your wrapping supplies. This could be just going to Goodwill and buying linen, blankets, a tarp, have it all ready and have it put aside where you know where it, all, where it is. Inspect your irrigation heads and the flow from, the, uh, from those heads. It was a really tough summer and our soil dried out and moved around because we all have clay. So sometimes um, our heads have been broken or things have changed. So take a good look and make sure that your irrigation is still in good shape. Apply pre-emergent herbicides. Um, lastly, clean your tools and start planning your spring garden. If you have specialty plants, if they're not cold hardy, start moving them closer to your storage area. This is just gonna save you a lot of time when we get notification that the big one's coming in. Take cuttings from those plants that you find most precious. Cut them and get them rooted. That way you can replant them in the spring. Cut down tropical milkweed. I know you've heard this from time to time, but why should you do it? We, we all forget. But the real reason is a protozoa that is a parasite that infect monarch, queen, and lesser butterflies. It makes them have deformed wings. They become, a, they're a smaller size. They have decreased flying endurance and impaired mating. In 1968, yeah, only one person. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but somebody wants you to reshow the garden bed slide again. All right. I was on a roll. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Here's your garden bed. You want to remove spent annuals, weed and clean your gardens because that... Um, takes away any hiding spaces for insects, divide perennials, transplant cool season plants, inspect plants for disease, insect pressure, and use healthy leaves as mulch or compost. Okay, and remember you. you'll get a copy of this so you'll be able to look back on it. All right, let's see, as I was saying, in six, 1968, only 1% of the monarch population had this parasite. As of today, it's more than 10%. One reason is because um, there is more density of where monarchs lay their eggs. And that's how they get this um, parasite. Uh, they, they're in little spores, they're on the plant, and then the larva ingests them, it goes into their gut. And then when they're in the um, cocoon, the uh, parasite matures and then uh, affects the uh, butterfly. 
And the reason that this has increased is because monarchs have, of course, loss of wildlife habitat, and also because there's a widespread planting of exotic non-native species of milkweed. That's that Mexican milkweed that we all plant. And people raising monarchs in large numbers in confined spaces. So be sure to cut that down. That should be something you do every winter and then uh, get rid of it. It can come back up next year and it will be safe for the returning monarchs to feed on and to uh, lay their eggs. So when it comes to our plants, who needs protection? Well, basically any plant that is a tropical plant. Um, we all have um, kind of gotten into the notion that, that, you know, we should be able to plant anything we want, whether it uh, naturally grows in Hawaii or Africa or Asia. And so, uh, citrus is uh, a plant that will need protection anytime it hits its threshold. And citrus has different thresholds. The most cold hardy would be a kumquat and its threshold is minus 15 degrees. From that point on, it will die. But a lot of that depends on how old the plant is and when it hits. But citrus, avocado, once avocado is mature, and that's more than five years, they often can go for a sustained period below freezing. But until they're five years old, they need protection every, every winter. Guava has very little protection. Mango, none. It just has to be protected. Pineapple is like a bromeliad. You really do just want to take it in if it freezes. Pitaya is a succulent and uh, it will freeze. Banana trees normally don't need protection. They will freeze to the ground and come back. But if you want fruit, then you have to take steps with protecting it. And a papaya, uh, boy, anything under 40 and it's suffering. So that would need to be uh, protected also. Also plumerias, if you have specialty plants like a plumeria plant, those should be also stored. Uh, normally, like all tropical plants, they're not, um, they are perennial plants. They're not uh, deciduous and they don't normally go dormant but they can be forced into a dormancy around this time of year by clipping off all their leaves and then digging them out and storing them bare rooted in uh, some warm place. And then succulents, you have to think of those also. Generally, the rule of thumb is the more um, soft the plant tissue is, the least amount of cold it can take. So if you have something like um, a thick skinned um, agave, that will do better than an aloe. So take a look at your succulents. Some you can leave out, many though, most you have to put away. While you're inspecting your plants, you wanna look for leaves that are black like this. It's a common fungus that grows on our plants if we have sucking insects. It's black, it's a fungus, it grows on honeydew. And that right there, that's honeydew. Honeydew is an excrement of sucking insects. And the sucking insect on this plant is scale. You can see it on the midrib here and on the different parts of the leaf. You can also see that there are yellow patches where the um, scale has, has sucked the nutrients and the, and the juices out of this leaf. When you look on the other side of it, it just looks spotty. So it grows on honeydew, turns the leaf black and it inhibits the growth of the plant. You wanna get it off your plant before you store it away for the winter. You also want to look for aphids. That's this little guy right here. Now aphids come in all different colors. And um, 
Sometimes they have wings, sometimes they don't have any wings, and it kind of depends on what time of the year it is. But you can see this little white stuff here that often throws people and they think they're looking at white fly, but really that's just discarded ectoskeleton. And then we have mealybugs. Mealybugs you're usually going to find in crotches, uh, underneath leaves. They're fuzzy little guys. They have a waxy coating. Makes it very difficult to use insecticides on them because the waxy coating protects them. And then we have scale. Scale is, unless you have a large um, uh, amount of them, most of them are going to be under the leaf. The scale is made of something kind of like a fingernail. Uh, the female adheres to the uh, underside of the leaf. She gives birth to live uh, scale. They live under her protection until they become crawlers. And then they go out and, and crawl around and feeding and sucking on the on the leaves. This is another picture of scale here, and they can be um, very, very prolific. And then we have white fly. White fly also suck the, the sap out of uh, plants. You can see this is an extremely heavy infestation of them. And then we have spider mites. You're not gonna look at a plant and see these spider mites there, unless you have a microscope, but you can see their damage and um, they're very damaging. All insects can overwinter on your plant. That's why you want to inspect and then take action. The other thing you want to be very careful of are uh, ants. You want to, if you have an infestation of mealybugs in this case, you want to look at the base of your plant and see, do you have ants going up and down? Ants farm. They farm aphids, mealybugs. They will move them around on the plant and they farm them for the honeydew. You can see this ant right here is taking a drop of honeydew from this aphid. And you can see here the aphid had been excreting the honeydew and all these little ones were feeding off of it. Nature is amazing. So what should you do if you find any of these insects on your plants? Well, you want to inspect your plants, of course. You can use double-sided tape around a limb to look for crawlers. These are when the very young begin moving. And that's when you really want to take action because that's when they are most vulnerable. You want to blow or rake all the leaves around that plant uh, away and uh, bag them up, don't compost them. Remove the mulch because these insects can uh, be down in the mulch. Bacteria and fungi can be in the mulch. And you want to control your ant communities and you want to weed. Again, that is a, a nice place for um, insects to hide. Now, if you're looking and you find leaves that have uh, kind of a serpentine gallery going through them. The leaves are curled. This is on uh, citrus. Then you know you have leaf miner. Now leaf miner um, only feed on the fresh flush of citrus trees. This is uh, in the spring, early summer, and here in the fall, you'll have a flush. So when the leaves are very small, they're called mouse ears. When they're really small, that's when your leaf miner is um, feeding and laying her eggs and she lays them between the layers of the leaf. So once that larva is laying and it's in the leaf, it, there's nothing you can do about it. You can spray all you want, it can't touch it. The one thing you can do is take a look at it. You can see the larva and you just squish it. And that gives you a lot of, gives me a great feeling of power to do that. So you look for the galleries. They're not gonna cross. They're just gonna move around. Eventually they come out to the edge of the leaf and that's where the larva pupates and then 
flies away. Severely damaged leaves, as you can see on this example, are curled and twisted. The big problem with leaf miner damage is that it is the number one entry for citrus canker, which is a deadly disease for citrus. The canker has to have an entrance into the plant. So it is looking for a wound such as this gallery. Remember that three-legged stool. You have the host, you have the pathogen, but what you don't have is a wound on your plant. Therefore, it can't enter it. But if you do have uh, a wound, such as leaf miner, then it can enter your plant. Leaf miners are dormant in the winter, but they will still be around uh, during the winter. They're just not as active. The Asian citrus psyllid is another uh, insect that is pretty predominant. We have to keep an eye on it if we have citrus. You want to look for damage such as these twisted leaves because again, the psyllid feeds on the brand new leaves that are just emerging, spring, early summer, and again in the fall. And it makes the tips have a twisted and kind of bubbly look as you can see here. Here you can see on this leaf. If you see this on your citrus leaves, you know you have psyllid activity. Now, not all psyllids are um, contaminated. Not all have um, the citrus greening, but it's very good um, recommendation to try to treat psyllids and keep them off your plant to prevent becoming infected. So a telltale sign that you have activity are these little tips. Unless you see the psyllids, which are these little guys, there's really not a lot you can do except keep looking. This is an adult psyllid. She's uh, only about a quarter of an inch at uh, adult. She has bright red eyes and the one way you can really identify her, she sits at a 45 degree angle when she's feeding. The second sign that you have psyllids would be this waxy corkscrew excrement that the nymphs will excrete. You see that, you know you have psyllids. So what you want to do is, oh, and also she is dormant in the winter but you will still want to look for her eggs. So what do you do if you, goodness, what do you do if you have either of these? Well, as I said, the insects only uh, attack the new flush. So this new flush is what you want to be most concerned about. If you already have um, uh, leaf miner or citrus psyllid damage on mature leaves, it, it means nothing. Don't be worried about them because the insect that caused that damage is no longer there. And as long as your leaf is still green, it's still working in photosynthesis to help produce nutrients. So only be concerned about the new flush. And what you want to do with that is to um, spray it. Oh, I am not there yet. I'm not there yet. All right. Cultural control is to uh, do not prune off the damaged leaves. That will only encourage your citrus tree to produce more new leaves. So you're really just making a new buffet for them. You also uh, don't want to fertilize at the times of years that, that these insects are most uh, active, which again is the spring, early summer, and in the fall. Because the more you fertilize, the more the citrus will produce new leaves and the more damage you will have. So the chemical control, and it is difficult, and you have to be careful of overuse of insecticides because they reproduce so quickly, they can build up a resistance to um, the chemicals. So a horticultural 
oil, such as um, summer oil or neem oil, can be applied to the new leaf growth. And it only has to be the new leaves, not the old ones. You want to inspect for insects often. Uh, the oil will deter egg laying. And then you want to spray with spinosad. And preferably you want to do this on uh, like a two week basis, a 10 to 14 day period. You want to spray your oil and then you want to spray the spinosad. So the oil um, repels them from laying eggs. The spinosad helps kill them when they're feeding. So if you can do that, usually um, in the um, spring and then again in the fall, you can help knock this pressure down from um, the leaf miner and the Asian citrus psyllid. And then we have mites such as rust mites and spider mites. So mites feed primarily on leaves and they can cause significant stippling in leaf drop. Generally, they're going to start their life on the side of the tree that is furthest away from uh, the, the sunlight. So they're usually going to be facing more to the north and to the south. And then as uh, summer comes in, they're going to gravitate more to the inside of the tree because they don't really like uh, that much of the sun. Now, those are the mites that, um, like the red mite and the citrus mite, spider mites, love the heat, but they are underneath the leaf. Too much leaf drop can lead to fruit drop and overall weakness of the plant. Warm temperatures allow the mites to thrive. Leaf drop can then result in the sunburning of fruit, dropped fruit, and reduced photosynthesis, which means simply the plant becomes weakened. Spider mites are mites, so they will overwinter in the nooks and cranny of your tree. So what you do about mites is in the fall, you wanna rake all your fallen leaves, remove the old mulch, you can use double-sided tape again to track movement so you'll know when they're going dormant and know that they are difficult to control. You don't want to expect to eliminate them because you can't eliminate them, but you can knock their numbers down to a controllable amount. In the spring, after you've cleaned all this out and refreshed with new <clears throat> mulch, in the spring, you wanna spray your tree with a very strong stream of water during peak mite activity. And again, this is when you can use that double-sided tape to catch them when they're moving. You can control them with miticidal oils and soaps. Thoroughly cover the upper and lower parts of the leaves, twigs, and branches. Mites are not killed by regular insecticide. So be sure to check and make sure that your chemical is designated as a miticide. Effective use of oils require that oil persists on the tree long enough to suffocate the mite, but not long enough to cause injury to your tree. Repeated use of oil can cause your tree to um, re have a reduction in photosynthesis. So you don't want to overuse the oil. You want to use it just enough to try to smother those that you can't get off by just spraying with a heavy, strong stream of water. Okay, we're going to talk quickly about this scale. If you have crepe myrtle, you want to take a quick look at your crepe myrtles. And if you see this growing on your crepe myrtle, then you know you have scale and you need to take steps. You wanna wash your tree with soap and water. Uh, if it's a smaller tree, just use a brush, soap and water and wash it as best you can. Otherwise you can use a, a hose in washer that you can add soap to. You wanna do that in early March. 
and then you want to drench it with imidacloprid, three ounces per foot of tree height. At the end of March, mid-April, you can use uh, dinotephorin for the contact spray. You don't need to do both. You do either the drench of the imidacloprid or you do the contact spray, one or the other. If you want more information about crepe myrtle bark scale and how to treat your plant, this is the website you want to go to. Now, when you're doing this, look for these little creatures. Look for these, they don't even look earthly, but what they are, these are the nymphs of the twice stabbed lady beetle. And she is the number one predator for crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, the nymphs eat twice the amount of the adult uh, beetle. So keep an eye, if you see those, don't be drenching them or killing them. Okay, bacteria. Um, there are several bacteria that cause very serious problems on plants, such as fire blight, leaf spot, bacterial canker. Uh, bacterial leaf spot can be found in landscape trees and shrubs, and more severe in areas that have moderate rainfall rainfall or use overhead watering. These are some of the examples you'll look for. This is fire blight. This is uh, bacterial blight. This is the bacterial spot. This is canker. This is canker. So bacterial diseases can be controlled by using resistant varieties a moderate use of fungicides. Cultural practices would be plant in a sunny area. Do not crowd your plants. Avoid overhead watering. Prune and destroy heavily diseased branches. Rake and destroy fallen leaves. The most widespread and damaging to fruit and nut crops are fungus. They survive on the diseased plant material or on alternate crops. They can cause vascular wilts, root truck, fruit rots, leaf spots. They're most severe during periods of high humidity and when the plant tissue is covered by a film of moisture, which we call dew, or overhead watering. The favorable temperatures are 70 to 85 degrees. So that is our spring and our fall. This is what fungus will look like. Now we've already talk, talked about the sooty mold, but you have scab and you also have greasy spot. This is the leaf spot. Also it's uh, Circospora or Endomalsbrium. So you're gonna see this mostly on um, hawthorns, pittosporums, those type of plants. The, the type of plant you use for your, your shrub foundation. And you can notice it right off. See the red patches, orange, the spots in the leaves. All of these are um, bacteria that are just waiting to go dormant, to lay on the ground because these leaves are gonna drop off. And then in the spring, as soon as water hits them, they're back in business and they're jumping back onto your plant. So one way to mitigate some of this cycle is uh, spacing of the plants to improve air movement. Speed up the evaporation of moisture by using surface or drip irrigation, or simply, or if you must use overhead, schedule it between like two and six in the morning, or even as late as midday to reduce that period of wetness on the leaf. You want to collect and discard the fallen diseased leaves, which is an important source of fungal spores, and they'll reinfect the next spring. So the pattern we see here is that we should not crowd our plants together. We should avoid overhead watering. We should prune and destroy heavily diseased branches and even entire plants. 
and we should rake and destroy diseased fallen leaves because it all adds to a reinfection in the spring and the cycle begins again. So winter. Okay, this can is, I make a couple of questions by you now or you want me to wait? No, let's go ahead and do questions. Okay, all right. So there's a general question that I'm not sure what it is. Uh, I'm trying to go. Okay. So if we do have a bit of green stringy material about a centimeter long, which appears to be blown in on the wind, growing on the branches of the bushes and shrubs, which appears to be spreading in the garden on the bushes, um, what is the best way to potentially get rid of this material? in order to improve the garden? Green stringy material. Uh, green stringy material. I'm not sure what that green stringy material might be. I'm wondering, um, um, I'm wondering, are you thinking about, um, hmm. Hmm. I don't know what a green stringy on the wind would be. Now, uh, we do have ball moss and we do have, um, well, we have Spanish moss and it starts out green. We also have uh, resurrection moss what Which is the lichen, 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 or lichen? Lichen. We have lichen. It's lichen grows on everything uh, from trees to rocks. So um, it's not a threat to the garden. In fact, it's actually um, a sign that you have very good air in your garden. So I would think um, it can, some of it can look stringy. Um, some of it can be green, it can be gray, it can be yellow, it can be uh, ooh, black. There are a lot of different colors, but if you're talking about lichen, there's really no uh, problem with it, nothing to worry about. In fact, if you try to remove it, you can actually open your plant up to disease because lichen, lichen is two organisms, as a matter of fact. Um, it's uh, algae, and I forget what the other part of it is, but it roots in, it puts its roots into the bark of your tree. Now, it's not a parasite. It doesn't feed off your tree. Uh, because it even grows, as I said, on rocks. It grows on a brick wall. It grows on sidewalks. It grows just about any, anywhere the spores land. It takes all of its nutrients from the air. So it's not a threat to your plant. Um, it only grows, as I said, when where the air is really good. So you probably have a nice, healthy yard. But lichen is not a problem uh, not to worry. Okay. Okay. Are there? Yeah, there are a couple more. Are there other questions? Yeah. So uh, the next question is, um, if uh, are the pheromone sticky traps useful for citrus uh, leaf miner? Well, sticky traps are useful in that they will capture and hold whatever lands on it or even brushes a wing next to it. We don't have a pheromone for the leaf miner. Uh, in particular, pheromone is a, a hormone that signals a uh, mating signal. We don't have one of those, but you can hang just a sticky tape or sticky tab on your tree and they will pick up uh, any leaf miner that uh, blunders into it. But the other thing is that it will also uh, grab and, and hold anything else. So any predators um, that are looking to, to eat the psyllids or the, um, or the leaf miners will also be um, 
killed. So, you know, there are unintended consequences to everything, but um, yes, you can use sticky traps for leaf miner and silly. Do you have another one? No, I think that's it for now. All right. So um, I was saying this uh, photo I took of my garden in uh, 2018 when we had the big snowfall. And this picture was taken during the day. So you can see it was pretty, uh, pretty gloomy uh, on that day. So freeze injury, these are my oranges covered in ice from another year. So freeze injury is influenced by several factors. So you remember the slide where we talked about those plants that needed protection. So we'll continue with that. These are uh, kumquats with snow. So the amount of damage you receive will depend on the minimum temperature of the event. The duration of the minimum temperature, the time that the freeze occurs, the tree size or, or your tree age, stage of quiets. This is that period of time where trees that are not deciduous, but are, are temperate and evergreen. When they slow down their growing to a, a, a creep because they're going into an induced uh, dormancy. The variety of your scion and your rootstock and overall tree condition. So when you have a, an event, a weather event coming in, the amount of damage you can expect will depend on all of these um, items. So how bad will it be? Well, three to four hours at or just below a threshold temperature. Now, a threshold temperature is I have a um, citrus plant and it can only take temperatures down to um, 35 and then it, it, it will die. So that's my threshold temperature. So three or four hours at or just below a threshold, it can be more damaging than a brief drop to a few degrees below threshold. December freezes invariably cause more damage than a similar freeze would cause in late January. Tropical trees can acquire cold hardiness by exposure to cool temperatures at a gradual rate. So trees in January usually are more hardy than December. Now, that's generally true, but we found out last February that that is not always true because we had very warm weather last winter uh, it was a very moderate winter until February came along. And then suddenly we had that huge uh, ice storm. So at the time we had been experiencing, I think it was mid 85 degrees for weeks. And all of our trees had come out of dormancy and they were beginning they had gotten the trigger that everything was good and they were starting to uh, bring sugars up. That's why it was so devastating because our trees were out of that quiet. It had, they had moved on. So that freeze in February was much worse than anything we could have gotten in January or December. So how can we protect our trees? Well, the best way we can protect them is by using radiant heat. So we use blankets, but blankets do not keep plants warm. Blankets keep us warm, 
because we make heat. We produce our own heat, the blanket holds it in. But plants do not generate heat. And so your landscape lollipop, where you just wrap the top of it, are not effective. And they actually exclude available heat, which is in the soil. On a cold night, the soil heat will rise into the foliage and be trapped in the canopy. We can use blankets to help capture this heat. And trapping the heat doesn't mean that you're warming it. It just means that the air is warmer than freezing. And if you keep the temperature around the plants from dropping below freezing, you've accomplished your goal. And even cold soil is actually significantly warmer than freezing and thus a source of heat on a cold night. So soil, bare soil, is your best friend for protecting your tropical plants. Steps to consider in uh, cold protection is site selection, cover, water, banking, and insulation. So site selection means finding a better place for your plant, south side of a windbreak. And that windbreak can be a fence, a house, a garage, a shed, even a hedge. These items will absorb heat throughout the day and release radiant heat at night. Cover. For a freeze, you want to lay the cover over the plant and allow it to drape all the way down to the soil on all sides. Secure that cover with bricks, boards, rocks, whatever, even a, a bank of soil, because you want to stop the wind. The wind can drop temperature quickly. And you know from experience that it seems to me all of our big weather events are accompanied by high winds and rain. And this can, can really uh, mess up any plans that you might have for protecting your plant if you don't have your cover secured. So you're really wanting to tent that plant. You wanna rake any mulch you have back. You want to uh, have watered that plant well and let it heat up, put a tent over it and secure the bottoms as well as you can. You want to remove the covers the next day so that the soil can heat again and then cover it back up when the sun starts to go down. You can also use cardboard boxes, uh, garbage cans, all of that type of thing. Plastic sheets in and of themselves will burn the leaves. So you never want to put plastic directly on a plant, whether it's a plastic sheet or whether it's a plastic garbage can. You want to cover it with some type of blanket, some linen, and then you will put the plastic over it because the plastic will then help shield the plant from not only the wind, but also from the rain. All right, so this is our lollipop we were talking about where the covering just simply goes around the canopy and then is tied up around the base of the tree. That's a no-no. What you want is a tent where it goes all the way around the drip line and is then secured around the bottom. There's a spun-bound polyester row cover that works very well for this. The heavier ones are called frost blankets and they are the best to use for uh, big freezes. Water is very important. Plants under drought stress are more susceptible to cold damage. Uh, you want to water your plants several days prior to a cold event coming in. And watering plants right before freeze creates a source of warmth that will slowly lose its heat over the course of a long cold evening. This alone is not going to provide full protection from hard free freezes, but it does make a small difference and every little bit helps. So this is another uh, good tool to use for protecting your plants. I use this for citrus because you can use it for 
really any grafted plant. So the majority of citruses are uh, grafted. Um, mangoes will be grafted. There are other plants that are grafted. And that simply means that you have a rootstock. You've grafted a different plant on that rootstock and then it grows as one tree. So the use here uh, is uh, the five gallon bucket. The bucket is full of water with a lid on it. And then you stack it around the plant and it heats up in the sun and then gives off enough radiant heat during the night to protect maybe not your entire canopy, but it will protect your graft unit which is the most important part of that tree and your inner trunk. So it works quite well for um, any plant that you want to uh, just protect the trunk of it. Banking is also an excellent way to protect your, your uh, trees. Clean, cultivated, packed soil absorbs more net radiation from the sun and releases more energy at night. So soil banks can be placed anywhere from Thanksgiving through February. Um, it's not unusual to put them up in uh, November and then in March, just wash them away. Soil banks need to be of topsoil, not mulch and not um, leaves and not sand because all of those are quite porous and uh, the cold can get in between. You want good topsoil packed as high up the trunk as you can get it, pack it very tightly, wet it, make sure that it's good and firm. Before a freeze event, you should go and check because sometimes with winds, um, you can wallow out an opening between the trunk and the soil. You're just going to pack it back in, make sure it's very tight. So these are examples of banking. Uh, in this one, we use five gallon containers. We cut the bottom out. We put them over these uh, little seedlings. These were very young citrus plants. And then we did fill it full of uh, mulch. And the reason we used the mulch is that it was cheap. And uh, the other reason is because the plastic of that uh, container kept the coal from seeping into it. This one is a soil packed avocado tree, and then it has mulch put over it to uh, keep the soil from washing away. And then this, uh, as you can see, is a nice soil packed uh, banking. Insulation. Now we're talking about attic insulation, the stuff you go to Home Depot and buy. Um, and insulation, it keeps ice crystals from forming in the cells of the tree. Pipe insulation, sheets, styrofoam, plastic, the results uh, from research have shown that they're all pretty spotty and they simply don't work that well but sheets of fiberglass insulation will work to protect from freezes. You wrap the plant prior to the freeze, and is, uh, but you have to remove it as soon as the freeze is over because that plant will burn up. This is what it looks like. So again, these are more of our uh, little citrus uh, seedlings, and we've put the, um, attic insulation around it, bound it with uh, twine, and then put plastic trash bags over it to keep uh, the insulation dry. This is a fiberglass wrap, polyurethane wrap, and this is a foam wrapping. And the problem with all of those is that it is not as secure as topsoil and water and ice can seep down between the tree and the, um, and the tool. And so they're not effective. Sprinkler systems, some people really think that they can 
protect their trees. But the problem with leaving a sprinkler system on all night is that it usually freezes and then you no longer have protection. So questions? Um, uh, Jane wanted to know, like before you said all these things, like she thought since culturally we were always told that we should mulch up to protect and she was surprised to hear you say that soil, top soil is the one, not the mulch because mulch is porous. Uh-huh. So, uh, oh, okay, now what is she actually asking about the mulch? No, no, she she thought like mulch gives more protection. Oh, than bare soil? Yeah. Okay, mulch is a wonderful, wonderful material. But why do we use mulch? Well, we use mulch to retain moisture and to cool the soil. That's really a primary reason is to cool the soil because when your soil heats up to over a hundred degrees, which is very easy to do, uh, the roots of the tree are no longer growing. They become uh, stagnant. So uh, mulch will cool that soil. It will help retain moisture and it keeps uh, the grass growth down. All of that's wonderful from spring to fall. However, in the winter, you need heat, not cool. You need the moisture to dissipate quickly, not be retained. So it is best for your trees to move that mulch back to the drip line and then have bare ground from the trunk out to the crown. And this will help in winter protection. Now, if you're talking about your live oak tree, that doesn't matter. If you're talking about your peach tree, that doesn't matter either because that peach tree has gone dormant and it's, you know, it's not functioning at this point. But if you're talking about a tree that is a tropical tree, uh, it, something like a fig tree, which is a, a semi-tropical or a citrus tree, uh, something like that, you want bare ground because that's going to um, absorb the radiant heat and then uh, release it. So- Any uh, other questions? Yeah, I have a couple more. How do you predict ingrown okay. papaya trees for winter? Uh, Sheku has sunrise papayas. Uh, how do you protect in-ground papayas for winter? Yeah. All right, well, there are a couple of things you can do, but honestly, the best thing to do is grow them as a container, and then you can you know, whip them in and out of a garage or something. If they get too tall, um, I've had some that have just, I've, you know, you take them in and then the next year they grow and then, uh, and then they're too tall. There are things you can do. One is to cut it off. So um, papaya is a herbaceous plant, it's hollow in the middle, lots of fluids on the outside. So you can cut it off, put a um, tin can or aluminum foil or plastic bucket or something over that cut part because you don't want rain to get into it. Then a tomato cage, and then you can pack that area as much as you can with um, soil, with um, heavy leaves um, up as high as you can. Now, the leaves are gonna be porous. They're not gonna do as good a job. If you have a big uh, storm come in, take some plastic out and cover the whole thing in plastic because um, you know the, the cold and the wind's just gonna rip right through those leaves. But you wanna pack it tightly uh, I usually put a trash can over mine. You know, you have the, the stump, you have the um, cage over it, the tomato cage. And then uh, I just put mulch in mine because that's what I have. And then I put a trash can over it when the cold comes. 
and that's it. Generally, it will come back again from uh, the base, uh, depending on how well you covered it. It might come up from the root again, or it might come up six or eight inches from the base, and then it grows pretty quickly, and generally you can have fruit that year. Any other questions? Yeah, there are other questions. How high up the branch should the topsoil be packed? Okay, if you're banking, then you want to get it as high up the trunk as you possibly can because you want to protect as much of that trunk as you can. A, a must is that it must be higher than the graft union where those two trees were put together. So it has to be higher than that. But the further you get it, the more trunk space you have that will be able to sprout and give you a new crown. So as high as you can get it. Definitely higher than the graft. <laughs> Definitely, that's minimal. Yeah, okay. So if you have a wet freeze, how do you keep the fiberglass wrap from weighing down small trees and breaking limbs? Should you cover with plastic after the fiberglass? Yes, if you're if you're doing the fiberglass, and really this fiberglass is really only effective in saving small trees, and graft unions, and that's about it. But if it's a small tree, you have your um, fiberglass and you're gonna sandwich it around the plant, just smush it like that, wrap it tightly, and then you do have to put plastic over it to keep it from getting wet because the fiberglass is very light, it weighs nothing, but it's also um, very porous. And then it only has a little paper backing to it. So any rain is going to be absorbed immediately. And yes, then it will come become very heavy and frankly useless. So as soon as you put it on, you wrap it with plastic or a trash can or something to keep it dry. So somebody, Sean wants to know if, uh, if they are like cutting down a dead oak tree, can they grind it and use that material as mulch? Well, <laughs> yes, you really can. Um, however, I would just um, say to you that it would be better if you're going to take down the tree and you're going to grind it. Number one, make sure the tree is healthy. Make sure it's healthy and it does not have disease or, or uh, parasites. Then you want to pile it up in a big pile and let it season at least for a year. Then mm. apply it as mulch. And the reason is because it's going to be so uh, green that it will literally pull nitrogen from your soil in order to decompose. So let it decompose for like a year and then you should be able to use it uh, as mulch. So what about shaded gardens? Do they absorb enough heat from the ground to make it worth covering with blankets or, or banking with dirt? Well, uh, well, that would depend on how shaded it is. And remember, you just want it to be above freezing. It is, I can't really remember all these years of our soil ever freezing. You know, we're going to get ice and we're going to get cold, but our soil doesn't, our soil doesn't actually freeze. So, even in a shade garden, you will want to water and then it should be able to pick up enough just ambient heat so that it, it is above freezing. So yes, blankets would hold that heat in. So yeah, I think it would be worth it. You know, it all depends. Uh, the thing about uh, winter 
protection for your plants all depends on how valued that plant is to you. You know, if it's a plant you can easily replace or it's a plant that, you know, you've taken cuttings and you're going to replant in the spring, you know, you don't have to do any of this. Just let nature take its course. But if it's a plant you've put in several years uh, into developing or, you know, it's it's an expensive plant, something like that. Yeah, you're going to want to take out all the stops to protect that plant. But it really, it just depends on how valued that plant is to you as to what type of steps you take. So what about mulching flower beds? Shouldn't shouldn't do that too? I mean, should the flower beds also be like banked with soil and not mulch? No. Now we're talking about different things here. If you have flower beds, um, you know, are you talking about shrubs in the flower beds or just your flowers? Just the because flowers. If it's just uh, if it's just flowers, no, I wouldn't go to that because flowers can be replaced pretty easily. Yeah. Remember, all of this banking, all of this protection depends on how valuable that plant is to you. Yeah. You know, if you have a kumquat tree that you've had, you know, for 10 years and you love the fruit, you're going to do whatever you can to protect that tree. But if you have zinnias growing, <laughs> let them go. Yeah. You know, it's going to be fine. They're going to reseed and they'll come back the next year. Yeah. So one slide said to encourage mantis, uh, praying mantis and ladybugs. How do we do that in our yards? Well, of course, you can buy... Hmm, let me see how I'm going to say this. You can buy just about any predator, uh, any uh, beneficial insect in the world because it's become big business now. Um, greenhouses have started using uh, uh, beneficial insects instead of spraying so much. Um, it just works out better. So they're available now online and all you have to do is google in and you can get them you can yeah. get praying mantis eggs and you can get um lady beetles at nurseries yeah now here's the catch they have to have something to eat and if they don't have something to eat you're going to release them in your garden and they're going to fly away looking for something to eat and your neighbors and I thank you for that. So, <laughs> you know, keep buying those like people. But um, one way to keep the lady beetles and to encourage them is to plant an area or to or in your garden, have an area that is beneficial to those lady beetles. Now, lady beetles are one of the few insects that actually can live on nectar over the winter until they're able to um, eat insects in the spring. So if you let your lettuce uh, bolt and go to flower, and you're gonna be feeding not only the few native bees that are still moving around, but you'll be feeding lady beetles. You can make um, a little holder of uh, just twigs or moth and put some raisins in there and they'll eat off the raisins. Um, plant cilantro, plant borage, plant any of the winter herbs and let them bolt and um, your insects will be able to feed off of that nectar and, and sustain themselves over the winter. So it's not just buying the insect, it's encouraging them to stay. And as I said, they have to have something to eat. So instead of, uh, if you see aphids, you know, do a little experiment. If you see aphids in your yard, um, you know, on Monday, right on your calendar, aphids, eek, and believe me, you'll see them if you have hibiscus. And then the next day, go out and see what's happening out there. Probably what you're going to see is that you now have lady beetles 
and other insects feeding off of them. And that's because they have to have something to eat. So um, you can buy them anywhere. You can release them. You may not have the immediate result unless they have something to feed on. But in general, you'll have the result because there'll be more beneficial insects out breeding and multiplying. Do we have another question? Yeah, are the commercially sold blankets made to keep the heat from the ground in or are they too porous? Are the commercial what? Commercial, commercially sold blankets. So there are these blankets with the thin material sold everywhere, online, Amazon, and oh, blanket blankets. Blanket. Yeah. Plank. Uh, okay, the blankets. You want to look for the uh, heavy one. Um, it, yes, they're good, but but there are light ones and there are heavy ones, and so you want the freeze cloth or the frost cloth. It's a nice, heavy, closely bound or closely spun fabric. And yes, they are good to keep the freeze off, but remember to put something under it because um, it can, um, generally when you use those cloth, there are hoops and you use those hoops, it holds the material off of the tissue of the, of the plant. And uh, that's really what you want. So just a sheet would do. Okay. Is there any specific brand of blanket that you recommend? No, there are a lot of them out there. Just, you know, go to your local nursery or just go to Amazon or Walmart. They all have them and, and uh, you just want a heavy duty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody wanted you, Rose wants you to repeat what you said about like doing the twigs and the raisins. Yes. Well, um, my Girl Scout, my Girl Scout troop made this one year. You just take little um, bamboo twigs like this, and then you can stuff raisins in the end of them, and then just hang them with a, a little ribbon or a twine to a limb out in the garden, and the uh, lady beetles can eat the uh, raisins. It's sugar, basically, is what they're consuming. Okay. Any special care about azaleas, like uh, banking or uh, covering or things like that? Azaleas uh, normally can uh, withstand freezes, and so that's not a problem. Um, you you really don't need to do that. The, the the biggest problem with azaleas in our area are the droughts. Um, they will they will um, disappear quickly if if you don't give them sufficient water. But normally they do not need uh, protection from winter. Okay, uh, Debbie wants to know, will moving blankets work or are they too heavy? They can be less expensive than the materials specifically sold for frost protection. Moving what blankets. What type of blanket? Oh, moving blankets. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, the problem, yes, you can use moving blankets. I've used them. I put plastic over them to keep them from getting wet because they get really heavy when they get wet. So that's something you have to consider. Okay. Uh... Okay, Sean is saying something about composting bins. I don't understand what. You can unmute yourself and uh, if there's a question, you can ask. Um, if the, We have another few minutes. So if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, we can do that. Oh, here's one. They want to know the best month to cut down the tropical milkweed. 
you want to cut down that milkweed generally in October uh, because it's when the um, when the um, monarchs and the and the queens are flying uh, south again. Um, that's when some of them can uh, start laying eggs, which you don't want. Now, there's a difference between you know planting the milkweed because that's really the nesting material and feeding them. And you do want to feed them, so you want to plant uh, the high nectar flowers that will benefit them, feed them, and give them enough um, strength to continue their flight. You don't want them to lay eggs on their migration back. So uh, October, uh, just to make a, a short answer. Okay. What else? Does pomegranate need protection? No, not really. Pomegranates uh, are Mediterranean trees. They're used to uh, dry, arid conditions with occasional freezes. Uh, your pomegranate may uh, freeze to the ground, but it will come back up. So uh, there's not a worry with that. All right, should cuttings be done on plumeria and, does, and uh, desert rose be done before storing for winter or in spring? Um, you, I'm not sure why you would want to uh, do a cutting if it is a plumeria and something breaks off or even on your, uh, your desert rose, if that breaks off, you can let it callous over and then plant it uh, in the spring. But um, there's really not much reason to be cutting them. If we do have a bit of green stringy material about a centimeter long, yep, that one I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know. She's going to send a picture oh. to the hotline. Oh, good. Okay, I had a hibiscus potted plant that I put in the ground in the spring. It has now grown seven to eight feet tall. How do I protect it from the winter months? Well, here's my suggestion to you. It's still potted. What you want to do is uh, trim it up. Get in there because it's, it's lanky now. So you trim it up, you uh, feed it, and then you put it away so that it will, uh, every time a freeze comes up, you either stick it in the uh, house or you stick it in the uh, a nice warm garage, but put it away somewhere. You don't wanna really leave it outside uh, to the elements. And then by spring, you'll have a nice uh, healthy plant ready to go again. But there's no reason hibiscus need um, to be pruned and there's no reason to have to struggle with a, a large lanky plant. Yep. Uh, la la la. All right. Now the person that asked the question has left or is not going to Sean. I think Sean is still here. Yeah, just no. I, I emailed the uh I emailed the details about the green uh material uh to your hotline. So thank you very much again. And I just brought up the idea if you do like the elevated compost bins, uh, for example, that they sell through Costco, if we could sell that to the master gardeners to make more money for the community and to encourage composting, it may be a neat idea. Uh, and I, I don't I'm not aware that you do that now. Uh, but again, thank you again for an amazing presentation. It's been very educational and beneficial. So thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm glad you got something out of it. <laughs> Hello. All right. Are there any other questions? Yes, I have a question. I was the one with the hibiscus. Um, I actually planted that in the ground and now it's like almost mm -hmm. eight feet tall. And I was Every every winter, I was bringing it into the garage. It kept getting bigger and bigger. So, is there any way of of helping that plant survive? It's up against a fence area. So, uh, or you know, do I need to be covering it in the winter? 
Is it a hearty hibiscus or a tropical hibiscus? I, you know, I'm not that kind of gardener to even know. Well, uh, a, a tropical is going to have a thicker leaf. Okay. And a hearty has a, has a thinner leaf notched. Okay. So I'm not quite sure. I'll have to go look. So hardy would be the thicker leaf that is notched. Is it what you said? No, it's a thinner leaf and it's notched. It's, you know, it can be nice and, and round. It, those you don't really worry about. Uh, they will okay. die down in the, in the winter and uh, then they'll just come back from the root again. So you don't want to worry about them. Tropicals, okay. though, the ones that their leaves don't tend to be um, notched. They tend to be smoother and they're thicker and they have a darker color to them. Um, those are tropicals and those you, you really do need to uh, protect. So I would take cuttings and root it up and um, take care of it. So in case the one in the yard dies, you'll be able to... Um, yep start new okay all right and roses do those need to be also protected no 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 they really really don't um if there's a rose you know that you're just enamored with you can uh, mulch heavily and then be sure in the spring to take all that mulch out of the branches and um but really they don't need any kind of assistance okay so there is uh shari has a question shari you can ask your question yeah i was this has been great i was just wondering where can we find the recording because i see you're recording it but how can we we get it um uh, to play it back oh you will get the recording uh, next week uh you okay. will get an email with okay. a link to that oh okay all right very good thank you have yeah. a good weekend everybody yeah thanks um, I don't see any other questions here unless somebody has a question and ask and I have a quick question. Okay. Um, so uh, my property is too small to really have like a big uh, composting bin. Are those little ones that um, you can get like at Amazon that you turn any good? You know, uh, <clears throat> I'm a lazy mulcher. I mean, a lazy composter. Those uh, that you turn, in my opinion, are more work than they're uh, actually worth. And uh, because number one, they tip kind of easily. And okay. number two, you can't put a lot in there. And so yeah, it's just one of those things. You know, you can mulch in, uh, you can compost in a lot of different ways. But um, for me, I, in my vegetable garden, I just compost directly into the soil. So I save my uh, scraps and then just dig a hole in a designated garden bed and bury it there and then, you know, bury here on Monday, there on Wednesday, that, you know, just go down the line and then uh, pile leaves and uh, grass clippings on it over the year. And then the next year I'll plant in that one. And then the next year I'll, I'll do another bed that way. And for me, that's the easiest way to compost because I just um, have good intentions to start doing it, but it's the turning and the flipping and the all of that that goes into it that I'm not very good at follow up. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm the one with the question about the plumeria and the desert roses. Yep. My concern is that yes. I have a couple that are I mean, like crazy long right now. And I was afraid they might break over the winter. Um, so uh, I just, which one, the plumeria? 
Well, actually, the Plumerian, I actually had a desert rose get have like a branch that went way off on a long tangent. <laughs> I'd never seen that before, so I wasn't sure to whack it off okay. now. Or so, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and take it off, but you know, the desert rose has a calyx, uh -huh. you know, the big bulb at the bottom. Yes. And so every spring, you need to raise that calyx out of the soil. So um, you have your calyx, you know, you bring it up and then just cover the roots at the bottom of your, of that, of that calyx. And then you put it in full sun. So, um, a, well, full sun until like two in the afternoon and then it should get some shade. And so that will keep your branches from growing long and spindly. It will keep them more uh, down and it will produce more flowers for you. But you know, that calyx has to come up out of the soil. That's great information. Thank you. I, I had them in pretty full sun, but I guess it just needs to be more. <laughs> So, yeah, they'll they'll get real spindly on you if they don't have enough sun. Thank you. This was a great presentation. Oh, thank you. So All this, right. any other questions? Uh, this is Jane, and it is an excellent presentation. Would banking or any of the other processes work for bottle brush or help with bottle brush? I don't during a freeze. Yeah, it would. Banking would be probably the easiest way. At least you would uh, protect the roots and uh, keep them from uh, freezing over. But also, um, it it depends on the size of your plant, too. If you have the, the small bottle brush, kind of shrubbish-like, that's just as easy to throw a blanket over. But if you have a tall uh, bottle brush, then yes, go ahead and bank that uh, trunk or the multi-trunk, get it all banked up. And then in March, when uh, the freezes are all over, just wash all that soil off. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I think that's a wrap. And uh, I hope uh, all of you have uh, taken a picture of the survey and the survey will help us uh, to get you programs that you are interested in. You can suggest the topics to us. Uh, we are ready to roll for 2024. We'll be starting our new set of classes in uh, February 2024. So come back for more. And in the meantime, start listening to all these uh, videos and plan your garden, plan your uh, spring garden now. So with that, I think we are done, Debra. Thank you so very much as usual for your extensive knowledge, for sharing it with everybody. And uh, hopefully this winter okay. will not be as brutal. <laughs> Fingers yeah. crossed. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>